Hi, Scott MacArthur here and welcome to the Edge of the X vlog. Um, today I'm speaking with uh, Rob Robson, Chartered Psychologist, former HRD and Business Consultant. Hello Rob, how are you doing? Hello Scott, I'm good thank you. There Scottish you accents. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, both on missionary work. <laughs> That might go in the showreel. <laughs> so um, what I'd like to talk to you about today, Rob, is I've given you a bit of a background earlier, um, but I've kind of realised that we need more longer form thinking on the topic of, you know, what on earth is um, HR and anyone involved in, in people in organisations, which is basically everybody going to do, um, given the situation that we're in at the moment. And one of the things that I believe unlike 2008 where you know it was mainly organizations that were impacted and there was a lot of individuals impacted as well but this time where we have uh i guess you could call it like an existential crisis you know a real shock for everybody um i call it a threshold moment mm -hmm. and i think now's the time for hr in particular um but not only HR, but for HR to step up. And, and I think they have yeah. actually stepped up. I mean, I haven't quite impressed with what the profession has done, but I'm not hearing an awful lot about, I mean, there's lots of lists out there about things you should focus on. And, you know, the usual suspects are publishing 20 things you need to do if you're going to meet the post-COVID issues. You know, there's all that sort of stuff. I'm not interested in that, right? Uh, I, want to, I want to talk to people who are doing the job um, who or have done the job um, to try and help people because I know people are struggling. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Great. Okay. So can you give the guys a, a little bit of a, an introduction to yourself? What are you up to and a little bit about your background? I don't even know where you were born, mate. <laughs> but, you know, a little bit of background. I was born under a wandering star. Ah. <laughs> um, yeah, so as, as you said, I'm a chartered psychologist. I was actually chartered originally in... Uh, sports psychology um, and so before that I'd been I'd, I'd been a graduate in, in IT consulting and and so I went back into consulting after that and that's where we originally met at, um, at Atos um, so I went into the people and change realm and I've spent all my career really since then since that was 2005 mm -hmm. in you know, change, organizational development, HR, although more, although I was an HR director, more OD and, and change really than, than HR itself. Yeah. Um, and I, a, a couple of years ago, I was, uh, you know, made redundant from the HRD role and set up my own business it connect as you know mm. and um I, I set up uh it connect and I, and i did that as a response to the specific circumstances of of redundancy didn't really have a plan didn't really want to just go and work you know just for myself on and certainly by myself yeah. didn't really have anything else particularly had in mind so i started off it connect and um did that for a couple of years but last year was you know a disaster um but i had been i'd started i you know after i started it connect I, I actually started to i became an advisor to um a company called the performance uh, the people experience hub uh which was started by a guy called nick court and they actually pitched to me when i was still at, at tata in my hr role and um, although I, I didn't go with them, in fact, we didn't change supplier, I, we kept in touch and I became an advisor to them. And we were doing more and more together, pitching together. In fact, we had a couple of, you know, pretty interesting proposals in just as at the point that we went into lockdown. So we kept talking throughout the whole lockdown period and, uh, and more and more, the conversation the conversation really just turned to so we just join up yeah and so in october we um you know we sort of told the world we joined up um and we sort of did made it more official behind the scenes as it were on the first of january 
yeah. and so I'm now formerly the COO and um, director of people, uh, yeah, director of people science at the People Experience Hub. Yeah. Uh, science, people science, I like the sound of that. Yeah, you know, it sounds that. quite sounds quite good, doesn't it? And yeah, it does. it and does. effectively, we're an employee feedback business. Right. Okay. So, if we could take it right into the moment, uh, Rob, because we're in the moment, you know, we've got to be thinking in the moment. And I know you, you know, you, you're always, you know, you're looking for opportunities to help people but we're now almost a year into this covid pandemic there's a light at the end of the tunnel and i don't think it's a train you know i think we're okay <laughs> um but you know what what do you think the the problem is that you're out to solve for companies now has it changed since covid or is it fundamentally the same um speaking as the current business, um, I don't think it's fundamentally changed, um, but the, it certainly changed the way in which some of the you know technology is being used, mm -hmm. and um, it's you know we 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 do the things that most companies would do in in in, in our world. So we do you know annual surveys, pulse well-being, you know, new starter, lever type stuff. Um, but what we're seeing, I think, is people making much better use, if you like, of the, the Pulse technology in particular to reach out and to gather, you know, so, so gather information from, from, from employees, how they're feeling, how they're doing in terms of well-being, um, you know, what they intend, what they want to do, uh, I'm looking back at the autumn. What do you intend to do when things are opened up <laughs> when we're working back in the office again? But 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 gathering you know people's intentions and understanding what people want to do, yeah. You know as as things change again, and so it it's it's nice because it moves us away from just people have quite fixed ideas, I suppose, but employee feedback and it it's, it should really be about you know it's all about employee engagement and. Yeah. You know, that's that's certainly one outcome that you can can focus on. But um, I think the we would deliberately allow people to be, you know, flexibility within the platform mm -hmm. and we don't impose a model. And and that's being been valuable to clients, I think, mm -hmm. since that since the pandemic and most of what people have been apart from when they've done their annual survey, mostly what people have been focusing on is well-being and more practical issues around COVID. Mm. I think the thank you. Um, the the well being focus is quite interesting to me. Yeah, definitely. Because, um, when I started my HR career with British Gas about a million years ago, um, after my initial training, um, I was a welfare officer, and it was there was forty thousand employees in British Gas Northwest, and it was one of the highest profile jobs in the business because you were running events, you know, every week, you know, football, yeah. quizzes, cricket, um, reading groups, you name it, we did it. Sewing groups, you name it, we, we had it. Um, and it was a major source of, um, ah, it's difficult to describe it. it. It created a cohesion in the business. We didn't measure a thing. Mm except the abuse we got, we got it wrong uh, and we got it. I mean, the people told us when we got it wrong, we had 50 welfare uh, houses, you know, like uh, clubs, social clubs yeah. in British Gas Northwest. And um, they were the hub of the community in nearly every town they were sitting in. Um, it was a major role. And it was funny, I was just saying to John Ingham last week, a previous guest, that Someday at last year's CIPD ACE conference, I, I had been speaking at it and I'd said to them, I don't know if you saw the interview, sorry if you've seen it, but um, somebody had said to me, oh, wow, it's amazing. HR could take responsibility for welfare and wellness. And I looked at it and I was like, do you mean it's not? And I think there's something in that. There's a story mm -hmm. in that because people saw that as no value. Yeah. It was massive value. It's an interesting one because it's, yeah. you know, you could equally 
you know, you could equally argue that it should fit under, you know, health and safety. Um, and I don't really have a, a strong view on where, where yeah. it should sit. Yeah. And I, th I think what I do have a, have a very strong view on is, is where, where people should be focused, you know, in terms of, um, of, of, of well-being. Because the whole, I think, I'm not going to suggest that people shouldn't run well-being programs mm. and shouldn't provide services that, 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 you know, that help people with whether it's physical, mental, financial, social well-being. Yeah. But I, I do wonder what the responsibility of the organization is. Um, and for me, the first responsibility of the organization is, is not to be the source of uh, the problem in the first place. Yeah. And my, my worry with health, with well well being is that the um, is that you know in some organisations it's they're throwing money throwing good money after bad because they're creating a problem on one hand and then yeah programs on the other to 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 lessen their effect yeah effectively mm. um, that's interesting uh, you know and do do you you know do you look at organisational health um first yeah and 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 that you know it's like one of these things you know, where do you start you have to start with something and, yes. and and during during the pandemic absolutely deal with the issue at hand you know and i think this is where hr's um focus is going to have to be quite carefully managed over this year I, I mean, I wrote a, a, an article in HR Zone, did the, 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 the end of year article, you know, at the start of the new year article, but didn't say, here are 10 things you should look out for in 2021. I sort of wrote, here's where I think some of the opportunities are and where, where some of the challenges are going to be. Yeah. And I think one of the, you know, I think that this, the fact that HR have become kind of thrust more into the limelight um, have... And well-being has been thrust more into the, the lim limelight in general. Is that is is both an opportunity and a challenge for HR because they, you know, there's an ex. I think what they what they've had to do inevitably has been very operational in focus. Yeah. The expectation may be that that's what they continue to do um, this year, and at some point, what they really need to do is try and find the role in in this rebuilding yeah and i like that i like that lifting the heads up from what has been for most a very operational quite transactional focus in many respects down down to even you know i hear of hr people having to you know just having a lot of one-to-one -one conversations with employees just to make sure they're okay and stuff and that's great and that's in the in you know in the, in the midst of the pandemic absolutely uh, be doing that but but at some point organizations in general and hr need to lift their head and go right where do we go now and what role do we play in that and okay you know they've they're gonna have to be able to do that without dropping the ball on some of the things that they've been providing and and doing kind of well in the last you know nine months or whatever yes. so get your crystal ball out uh i mean uh, yeah. two, two weeks ago uh the current prime minister of the united kingdom boris johnson uh said that he believed that people would flood back to the cities um mm. after uh the you know the widespread use of, of of vaccines um i'm not sure i believe that that is or I, i'm not sure i agree they will flood back um, I think they'll go back, but I'm not sure it's going to be a flood. Um, what are your perceptions on that? Because I, I, and it's a loaded question, Rob, mm. because I think depending on where we think it's going to go is where we need to think about helping people to get there. So yeah. where do you what do you think? What do you think? I think, so I think offices um, will continue to play an important role. Mm. I think they are very useful sort of social hubs, and I think it's difficult to do certain things remotely. Yeah. To really collaborate really well. I mean, 
you know with good tools with good facilitation and things you, you can do it but it's but it's but on an everyday level it's 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 pretty difficult um and um so i think i think people will be attracted back into the office i do think there'll still be some nervousness about it i think that um cities i think there's going to be a, a fairly permanent shift in the role of cities mm. and that people are going to be looking to work more locally so i think you know one of the things that you know people have not had to do is commute and i don't think you know i think it was you know this period is probably if, if there's such a way of saying it um, devalued the commute and, and and you know or put more value on not commuting if you see what i mean yeah. um and, and and so i think localization is gonna is gonna continue to be important so people are gonna want to 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 a fair extent, stay relatively close to home, and there's going to be nervousness about public transport for for quite some time. I would have thought, mm -hmm. and so yeah, I do I do think people want to go back to the office, mm -hmm. um, but I do think people are also anxious about going back to the office, okay. and um, so I don't see them flooding back either. I do see them going back and I do see them, you know, I do see that probably growing over a period of time, but the, the role of the office uh, for many organizations, I think will change quite a bit. I think the, I mean, you can only really reflect on your own experience in this area. I mean, I know there is some research, but um, I remember when I came out of a corporate role and it was, believe it or not, it was 10 years ago now. And um, initially, probably for a year it was terrific you know I really enjoyed the freedom um but then if I'm absolutely honest I was waiting for the phone call from the client to invite me to the Christmas party you know because you don't you don't have that anymore yeah you know um I mean just yesterday I don't know if I can grab it no I can't um I got a a letter a4 letter where it was with some stuff in it from a client from the states and it really made my day and it was trivial. Yeah. It wasn't trivial. It was the thought, you know, and I I seriously miss that. Now, I'm not saying everyone, God forbid, everyone thinks the way I think. Um, but I certainly think that uh, you said social, the word social uh, mm. in the context of, of organisations. I think that is something that I think we all understood it, but I'm not sure we saw it, if that makes sense. You know, it was... Yeah. It was right in front of us, but I'm not sure we all saw it. And I mean, there are toxic parts of that, you know, the pub and some other things can go quite badly um, socially. But I certainly have much more fondness for the office environment than I think others maybe have. I just I just miss it. Maybe it's because I've been away from it. I don't know. I mean, I'm blethering, but I do think there's an argument for some of the work maybe. I mean, I don't know if this is in agreement with what you just said. It might not be, but... I think there's maybe an argument for work being done at home, but the office becoming a social hub. Yeah. You know, it's almost a, because some enlightened organisations have been doing distributed uh, workforces for some time. Um, you know, why do I need to live in London rather than living in Paris or, you know, Boston to work for a company that's based in Manchester? I mean, why, you know, today? Mm -hmm. So I can see that changing. Is that in line? Yeah, I think, with so. I think so. I think I could see. I mean, I'm the same. I, I I enjoyed the freedom of you know being at home, um, but you know, and when things were going, even when things were sort of starting to pick up and grow before before lockdown, yeah. I was um, I did already start to feel the isolation. Yeah, you know, I. I I, the, if, if you'd asked me at that point, what do you miss? I'd say, I, I miss having colleagues in the work. I miss being in the office. Yeah. yeah. And, but I, what I think is in terms of work is that um, there are some things that you're probably better off going into the office to do. Mm. Some, many of these things can be done with the right tools virtually, but I think on balance, yeah. In terms of task, some of them are better off done in the office. Yeah. But there are other things that you 
I think people are just going to say, you know what, I'm not going to go into the office to just to do to do everything. No. You know, wh- why would I commute an hour at my expense to, you know, to sit at my desk? Yeah. Um, but I'll go in regularly because I, I, I want to see my colleagues and I'll go in for sort of value adding activities that that you know that need sort of collaboration and yes and, and and i think but i think and i think what's interesting is that this our response to to the you know to to to, to the post covid world if you like the, the thought of you know emerging from the the sort of the the chaos of it and everything is it, going to require a lot of collaboration a lot of creative problem solving yeah. that um that, that I think it will generally be better done, um, you know, in groups, face to face. Yeah. Um, so yes. yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I, I mean, I do. I totally agree with that. I mean, I, I, I find the the best of the technology um, is good for what we are doing. You know, one to one between two people who know one yeah. another. Um, and I find occasionally it's been quite good for networking. I've had some quite positive experiences of technology driven networking, but once you, I mean, for example, if in my, you know, my normal day job is keynote speaking and it's not the same, you know, you, you, you become almost like a television presenter, you know, you're, you're presenting to one person, not 500 and you naturally don't get the buzz in the room. You don't get the, the infection of the idea in the room, you know, that, that is gone. Um, and uh, and let's face it, the competitions, David Attenborough and co, and I'm not David Attenborough, you know. So you you've got a it's a different yeah. thing altogether, you know. It's it's quite it's quite different. And I think the mistake that I've seen, I don't know if you've seen this, but I've seen too many people on um, Zoom or MS Teams or whatever it is people are using, using it like they did a meeting face to face, and astonishes me i mean how many of them after a year are still doing it i mean it, it, it's um you know i see too much nose hair mate you know um <laughs> and it, it it does it amazes me but uh yeah okay so i mean we i look at what we're doing and you know we've just since we came back after lockdown one of the things that we've been doing is daily coffee I think two of the days it's in the morning two of the days it's in the afternoon or something like that and one of the days it's more of a a working catch up run the table what you ought to type stuff that all works better that all works really well it's a chance for everyone just to check in with each other and it works it's great on you know in teams when we I've, I've tried to i've tried to work through things in the you know in a like mini workshop but in in that informal way with colleague with with people in your team i think i find it a lot easier just getting on a whiteboard and you know, and sort of working through stuff in the office, I've yet to f- feel it working the same way virtually. I yeah, think if yeah. you're doing, and I think if you're doing a formal workshop and you've got the right tools and you choose them carefully and you prepare in a, enough in advance and everything, then that can work. But it's it, it's quite a skill, mm. whereas most of us can muddle through something face to face. Yes. You know? yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so yeah, it's it's I. I'm yet to. I'm. I'm. I'm not a massive fan of doing everything online, and I think there's something about the conversations as well. Um, the quality of of conversations. Yes. Um, I've yet to. I've yet to sort of suggest that we drop video in in our team, but I've noticed that when I speak to my mum, I've yeah. stopped. I've stopped doing sort of FaceTime or whatever. I just I, I now phone my mum, mm. and I have a far better conversation. Yeah, isn't it interesting that I mean that, that's a really really interesting observation. Um, but what's also interesting just popped into my head. There's that new social media platform just arrived, isn't there? That's just voice, and it's getting really oh, out. Yeah. It's getting loads of people talking about it and everybody's getting excited about it. That's not as daft as it sounds because, I mean, the new one's called Clubhouse. Everyone's flocking to it and I understand that. It's a, it's a shiny thing, you know, and people do jump on and 
um, I did that with blogging. I did it with vlogging. I'm doing it with vlogging right now. I mean, I was, mm. I was reminded it was quite nice actually. I was reminded I was either the first or the second HR blogger in the UK. You know, so I jumped on really early. Uh, yeah. Back when we worked together, that's when I started my blog. You know, it was that. That's, that. Grand. that's right. Yeah, <laughs> and it did. It did quite well. You know, and it, it was quite bizarre. The, but um, I think personally, I agree with you because I. I think you've got to get good at marketing on a channel and then you can spread out. And, and as I do with my live broadcast, you know, yeah. I'm focused very, very much on YouTube. And it just so happens that then I can then cross purpose it into Facebook, Twitch, Twitter, and everything else. Um, and no doubt I'll do an audio feed into Clubhouse at some point. Mm-hmm. But yeah. I think there's a lot of people perhaps, and I, this is not definitive, Rob, I'm not saying I know this definitively, but I think a lot of people are in danger of diluting their message even further by jumping on another social media platform. Yeah, I think that's right. I think unless you know, if you unless you've got an agency working on your behalf and doing, you know, making sure that you, it's better to be consistent on one. I think. Yeah, um, and that's certainly what I'm trying to do. And I think yeah, a lot of people yeah. are. Yeah. Just as an aside, when you said that you're focused on YouTube, yeah. a little voice in my said, my, my head said, "Who are you calling the tube?" <laughs> <laughs> so that that will lose everybody except any any other Scots that are. Uh, uh, that's one of the words that I use when I'm cross. <laughs> yeah, we tube. <laughs> there's there's a couple more, but we won't say yeah, what they are. No, no, no. <laughs> so if you were um, sitting in an HR director's corner office on the shard in the shard in um, six months' time, and say. And I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm making this up, right? We used to do this. It was like, what do we call this? Role play. It wasn't role play. What do we call it? Risk analysis or something. We'd scenario. Scenario planning is what we used to call it, wasn't it? Back in the consulting world. And you've got a third of your workforce wanting to stay at home. Mm-hmm. Another third desperate to be back in the office. And a third happy to do the another trendy thing at the moment to talk about blended. Yeah, everyone's talking about blended this and blended that. Um, how... What are the challenges that you foresee if that is the future? Because a lot of people are saying that is a a likely, if not a probable outcome from from the current pandemic. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think I'd worry about um, people becoming disconnected from each other. Right. There are going to be groups of people who are become more connected than others, and. You know, people that choose to work completely remotely, um, it's not going to be easy to keep them, you know, connected with their colleagues. Mm. Um, you know, from out of sight, out of mind to, I suppose one of the, the dangers is that people that choose to be completely remote, some of them it will be very much for, you know, reasons of, for example, small family and all that sort of stuff some will be because you know of personality um you know and i think there's a danger that some of the people that will choose it will be inclined to be okay feeling cut off from their from their colleagues and which i think has a negative impact on the group as a whole but also has potentially over time has that a negative impact even on the introvert that they may prefer not to have so much contact i'd be con- i'd be concerned without having the answers about your know, disconnection hmm. um i mean we didn't set this up did we but i i, I agree uh, and i worry in that space that there's a lot of people who influence the market just so happen to be vendors yeah who just so happen to sell technology that just so happens to solve that problem, bollocks. Yeah, and and, and I think it does depend a little bit about what about what you do because I suppose yeah. the more task focused, individual task focused your yeah. role is, the more remote it can be. Yeah, yeah. But you know, an awful lot of, particularly sort of in the corporate world, an awful lot of roles are not like that. You know, mm-hmm. we're. You know, I, I think maybe things like call centres and things like that, where people go and sit in banks and they, yeah. they don't have a lot of interaction with each other. Yeah, I can see the argument for 
for, for them being um, remote. But if you think about how much work you actually do in a day when you're yeah. in the office, yeah, uh, it's probably not that much. No, <laughs> I it's mean, not. Or, not. Or, or, or to put it a different way, you spend a significant amount of your time just chatting with your colleagues, having a bit of a laugh, and you know, having breaks and all that stuff, and and, and that's healthy. Mm. You know, it's um, now there are days when you you think actually I could take that, I could do an eight hour day, I could power through a load of stuff, and that's great. Yes, yes. But I don't know if it's healthy to be doing it that every day. A lot of people that I know have. That, that, that went you know, started working from home during the pandemic have just been spending their days with their head down a lot on zoom yeah um, or, or teams or whatever and it's just what they've done is take you know a, maybe an, an eight till six day or a half eight till half five day and gone from being in the office to being sat at the desk at home yes. But when you're in the office, you are interacting more. You are taking more natural breaks. You are chatting. You know, you're 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 bumping into people, mm -hmm. and yeah, yeah. it's it, 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 that 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 worries me a little bit that that people are, are missing out on that. And if that means, I mean, if that means that you just do actually you do I mean, six really good hours in a day. Then for some people that's that's a really you know that that's good. Know, I'm going to do that, and I'm not going to do any more. I'm going to use that time to do something else. Yeah, but organizations it's not in their nature. No, generally to encourage that. Mm. So I don't know. Yeah, you can actually see that one of the consequences of this, and that's in surveillance technologies that are all over the place. I mean, uh, my, my, my partner, Samantha, she was talking to a friend of ours a couple of nights ago, and he's just got a new job because he, he had a, a job that he can't do at the moment. It's just been blown up by, by COVID. And so he's doing it basically to fill the gap. And he, he's, he's online like, like this on Zoom, and they are actually monitoring his keystrokes, Rob. Now, he's laughing that off. He's laughing it off because he's not going to be there for long. So he's not bothered, frankly. But a lot of folk who don't have that, yeah, that luxury. I mean, what are companies doing? It's two thousand and twenty-one, you know. And it's it, the old uh, just because you can doesn't mean you should. Mean you should, <laughs> yeah. And I mean, you know, my long-standing issue with you know over measurement and um, you know and, and companies with their you know the the sort of think they have to measure everything. Well, you don't. Um, it's. I think there's a couple of things I would point out there. One is. That, that translates to fear. If you're being measured all the time, you're frightened of the consequences. Yeah. Not necessarily deeply frightened, but it just cranks up the, the anxiety in the organization as a whole. Yeah. That has negative impacts in terms of, not only in terms of how you feel and stress and all that stuff, but in terms of productivity mm -hmm. and, you know, like creativity and, and you know, and that sort of thing. So, you you know there's some of the, some of those businesses that are putting in surveillance t technology probably also say that they want their people to be more creative and innovative, <laughs> and, yeah. and so all they're doing is cutting cutting that off to some degree. Yes. And then and then I think the other side of it is that you know I've been doing a lot of kind of my own research into the concept of organisational resilience. It was. I was doing it in the run to Christmas and over Christmas, really as a marketing thing. I was going to push out a, you know, a guide to building back uh, after to co after COVID, based on building sort of organisational resilience. Yes. And um, I've I, I put it on pause because it doesn't didn't, with the way things tanked sort of over the Christmas period. I don't think it was quite quite no. the right time, but. No. One of the implications about that is that has three, you know, it's a simple, simple framework that says there are three sets of capabilities to organizational resilience. One is anticipation. The next one is coping. And the next one is essentially sort of integration or learning. Yeah. And 
the, the bit about anticipation is about, about looking down the line and seeing what's what's coming, being aware of your environment, being aware of what's happening in the market and all that sort of stuff. Mm. And being able to actually start, do things like scenario planning and, uh, you know, and, and a preparation for sort of non-specific, you know, potentially catastrophic events is, is the implication of that is that the organization probably need to hold a little bit of slack yeah. in order to be resilient mm. and encourage people to look outside and to go to, you know, things like maybe networking events and conferences and things which are not necessarily productive, but to be out there interacting, seeing and and to and but for their minds to be open to what's coming. Yes. And if people are just constantly monitored and feeling like they've got to be busy, busy, busy all the time, then actually what you're building in is you're making your organization more brittle. You're building in fragility. Yeah. yeah. Um and if we're and if and, and I think one of the things that we're gonna have to think about is is the, the economic model. And, and, and what we consider to be value in organizations, because we have, you know, in my view, without much doubt, overvalued um, efficiency yeah. um, a, 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 in organizations. Not that I, I firm believe it in, in real efficiency, which is things work with a minimum of fuss and they're effective and, you know, all that sort of stuff. You know, processes work, systems work all the rest of it but a lot of people in the drive for efficiency actually just pile more work on onto people and say fewer we can do it with fewer people which isn't really true Mm. it just overloads people and they become stressed and you know so it's a it's a concern about when it comes to sort of organizational resilience and i do think that organizations are actually going to have to reconceptualize value you know, in this in this world, uh, I, I, not that everybody's ready for the debate, but no. um, you know, things like sustainability and and and, and things like resilience are going to be you know things that are, that, that the organisations have to to put a, a much greater emphasis on in the mm. future. I think. Could I finally really take you back? And it might take a long a long time to get through the finally, but. Um, <laughs> Right at the start, you said when you were in an HRD role, you really were more active in the OD space, the organizational development space. One of the things I have observed, now I might I might be wrong, it might be just my bubble, you know, I might have got this wrong. Um, but what I've seen in the last couple of years has been, I've been very impressed with the OD community, at least here in the United Kingdom. I think the the quality of the work they're doing, the 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 attempt at you know putting in a scientific model, the also the the human side of it, you know, so there's a double-edged sword, um, has been pretty impressive. I can't say the same for a lot, and it's not fair because I'm I'm in my bubble, Rob, and I'm t- mm. by all means tell me I'm wrong, but. I'm not seeing the same thing in the HR community. I'm just seeing the same old stuff about you need that seat on the board and, you know, oh, you know, it's the usual stuff from HR. I have this sort of niggling <laughs> hypothesis that OD might be the future of HR. And I'm not even sure if they're the same thing or if they're different. I don't know. You know, I, I mean, there's, there's a debate in there. It's maybe the type of people that are drawn to OD rather than it being a different discipline from HR. I don't know. Um, what do you think in that? Am I just, is that nonsense or? No, I don't think it is. I mean, uh, first of all, I'll say that funnily enough, when I was in the roles in HRD, it was probably the most operational role I ever had. <laughs> But, but in my career, I was more yeah. OD, you know, I've been more OD in change. Yeah. Um, the, I, think, I think there's a couple of things that you touched on. One is the dichotomy is a little bit false. In some organizations, very, very separate, very distinct. Yeah. And I, I really agree with you that there's been, there is some fantastic stuff out there. Yeah. 
in the OD community. I I do I I do wonder how much they manage to cut through in organisations, and I think that I think this is a big big challenge for 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 the you know for the OD professional is is how you what 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 are OD professionals? Well, there's things like you know they're facilitators, they're sense makers, they're stuff that all can seem a bit wooly. Yeah. Um, but actually, when you you know, it's when you see it through their eyes, when you see it through shared eyes, you see that the value it brings. But it can be quite difficult for people to to understand that, because because we're still seeing that you know senior leaders in organisations just want action, they want solutions. Yeah. They, they 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 you know they they have this bias towards fixing problems quickly. Not not considered analysis and in all the, the sort of you know real value i think that the od professionals bring in um and some organizations get it and some and, and use you know od professionals really well yeah but i do think you're right as well that it's i think the you know we've had this model of hr business partners and I think, you know, I think we're going to need more flexibility within within HR functions. And I include it, I, I tend to think of OD as a sub-function of HR rather than the other way around. Other people will disagree with me. But it's, I, I think that we need to build those OD skills into our HR generalists, mm. give them the opportunity to, to influence mm-hmm. um, I think what the partnering model does is it puts a barrier between um, the, the the internal customer and the OD professional, you know, and or it can do. And I think I think we need to equip you know HR journalists with a broader set of skills, a more a more you know, change or OD oriented set of skills. Um, and, and and I don't know how that works with the sort of slightly more you know transactional aspect. Maybe they're brokers of the more transactional services. Maybe those transactional services will become more and more automated um, uh, over time. Yeah. Um, but I do think it's I think I think it's the skill set. It's a really important skill set. Mm-hmm. I think it's often undervalued, um, and possibly even within HR itself. Well, I mean, it strikes me, well, as always, we've been here before, because, I mean, I remember um, when training used to be called training rather than personal development, and um, uh, and they decided to come into the IPM as it was then, mm. uh, and the CAPD now, and there was an awful lot of HR people scoffed at that, you know, training, oh, we don't want to be doing training, Um now, personally, I think it's probably where the biggest value add is in most HR departments. But you know, I know people will argue against me in that front. Yeah. So we've been here before. Um, but one of my, and again, this is me typical keynote speaker. But one of the things I would love to to happen, and I think there's real opportunity for it, is I want 15 year olds to be saying, "I want to be an HR director." No, they're not out there. No, no they're no. not out there. Um, no. <laughs> and yet. We are the people who are looking after, you know, the mental stuff, the physical stuff, the operational stuff, the strategic stuff, the, the difficult, really difficult social stuff. You know, who wouldn't want to work in HR? You know, but I, yeah. I, I am not convinced that that balance is right yet. And I think, and I've said this to you, I think, before and to others that, I mean, I would love to commission a PhD to look at what, you know, just look at a, an HR magazine that's been around for 30 years and look at what they've been talking about. And my hypothesis would be it's still the same thing. You know, it, it's a static. Yeah. It, it hasn't progressed. And I mean, and I know that Ulrich, um, the business partner model you were talking about, nothing wrong with Ulrich's model. I mean, nothing wrong with Ulrich's book. His books are great. I mean, Ulrich was speaking about, and most I don't think most folk have read his books, but Ulrich was talking about Flim Flam 30 years ago, you know, nonsense pseudoscience which is hr is full of um 
and yet nothing nobody ever picked that up when they were designing yeah. their business partner model um so i i think that, that we over it sometimes and, and i think i've been over critical of of him uh myself uh and maybe i should have read deeper into some of it because it was always flexibility there um but yeah. it's not right there's something not right about it it's not it's such an interesting subject it is and i think that i think the sort of caricature i feel like of of hr is that i have in my mind is 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 of a function that is sort of in the in the trenches dealing with so much yeah. stuff that they can't lift themselves and they can't lift themselves out of it mm -hmm. they struggle to those that do can achieve incredible things oh yeah but a lot struggle to get out of the operational and that is in part because maybe the organization don't give enough investment to the right kind of systems and process changes yeah. and all that sort of stuff mm -hmm. maybe the hr don't make a strong enough argument mm -hmm. but i think they i think unfortunately i think it has been a little bit static i mean that's really unfair on a bit of on an awful lot of people I but agree. if you look at the function as a whole it's still talking about a lot of the same things mm -hmm. I do. I also think that it's this is this could. I think going back to where we were at the beginning a little bit, this could be HR's time. Yeah. And I do think that those OD skills are critical to that. And I almost see a, you know, a, a sort of a superhero emerging because it's the the where we are now. And you know, you'll know uh, Snowden's kind of in, you know framework. Where we are now is classic complexity. Yeah. Emerging from this into into what it, it, it we, we that whole stuff has to be worked out, and and one of the key things in that in that whole model on the complexity side is is sense making, and that is a core skill of the sense making, facilitation, driving collaboration, core skills of a good o OD practitioner. And those skills are so valuable, and, and those skills exist, and often those skills exist in people who perhaps find it a little bit difficult to speak up, yeah. push themselves to the forefront, and you know we have to find a way. They they exist in a lot of organisations, and I think they're often underutilised. So now is now is a time when well now not so much now but in the next six months uh, is a time when the, those skills really could come to the fore. I hope you're right, because uh, again, to finally, finally, we're not quite there yet, but one <laughs> of the, the other things that, it doesn't exist in, in every part of the organisations either, so I'm not suggesting that HR is unique, but if you look at, um, you know, most influential lists in HR, very few of them are actual HR people, you know, mm. they're academics, they're you know, it's, they're journalists, you know, you've got your Dan Pinks and your Simon Sinek's, your marketing expert, and you've got, these are not HR professionals, you know, and even Ulrich, who was, I think it was a furniture company, wasn't it? He, he sits on the board of a furniture company, you know, so he's an academic. So where, where are the practitioners? And I know there's a few, you know, um, but I, I often think about, you know, and I don't like the, the phrase really, but I know it's out there, the HR hero type thing. Where are they? There are some prominent HR directors out there. Yeah. But I, don't, I don't think there's enough though. You know, I, I, no. I don't see, unless I'm missing it, but I'm not aware of any, you know, group of real deep HR thinking people working together to try and build the profession you know if you go one, one, the, one of the best examples and i'm not saying hr is unique here there's a lot of other I mean, there's not very yeah. many finance people doing the same is there or yeah. or but there is some marketing but i did a fair bit of work with um systems engineers in the past and they love their subject so much that they it's almost like their loyalties to the subject not the organization they so love their subject mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know and i don't think that happens too much in hr i mean i see some recruiting people doing it, of course they do. There's the big thing at the moment, is, uh, and I and I know this is quite contentious, but I do think it's a bit of a fad. It was diversity and inclusion. Everybody's a diversity and inclusion expert at the moment, but interestingly, not many HR people are speaking up about DNI. No, which is really odd. I mean, the you know the, the the HR D's I know are are just busy. They're uh, just busy, busy people. And yeah. it was the busiest period of my career, I think. Mm -hmm. I, I had to lift my head 
I sudden, all of a sudden I had to rebuild my network and stuff. Yeah. And I think and that's an indication though, isn't it? What we were talking about before about having to step out of the, the trenches, having to step away from the busyness and, yes. and lift the level up. Mm. And it's a challenge because the issues don't go away by themselves. Mm. It's, it just, it's a lot of, um, it takes a lot of deliberate effort and focus, I think. Well, listen, Rob, that's been a, a fascinating conversation. I've really enjoyed it. Um, I would like you to come back sometime and have, let's have an argument about sport and business. Yeah, as we see it completely All the time in my life that yeah. we haven't looked at it absolutely yeah, quite differently. Uh, but and I'd love to have a chat with you about that. It would be great Excellent. if people are interested in getting in touch with you or finding out more about the the the, the offering that you have at the People Experience Hub. Where yeah. would they be best to to look for your for your contacts? Yeah, so I I can be emailed at, at rob at pxhub.io. And the website is pxhub.io. And my personal Twitter is um, Robert S. Robson. And, and I'm on LinkedIn as okay. in forward slash Rob Robson. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much. And I, and I really look forward to the next time we have a chat, Rob. Thank yeah, you. Good to talk to you again. Cheers.